What is up, guys? I'm hoping everyone can hear me. And I'm hoping that we are grooving and live. Um, oh, sick. I can double check that we're live because I can see us on Twitter. Want to make sure that everything is working appropriately. What is up, guys? Give me three seconds here. Cool. I see that Templar is here and he can hear me and the stream is clean. So that's going to be our go ahead to get this show on the road. What I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly show you what we're about to get into. And then I got a sick ass little intro plan while we get all our homies in here. We're at like 3,600 of us here right now. Um, but y'all have been asking me for a long time if we can see the notes. And my notes are all in this program called Obsidian. Um, which looks like this and it's hard to share it because it's like a giant set of files that you can overlay like this. And I've got all these different tabs and all these different things and their software is not really set up to share this part of their program. So I've been working on a way to share my notes with everybody for a long time. And this is how we can do it is we can live stream them. Um, hopefully YouTube doesn't kick us off of YouTube for live streaming the wrong notes. So I'm going to try to not go over to the Hunter Biden notes, um, on accident, FYI. Um, but here's the plan in a minute, we're going to get into the notes. We're going to get into the new stuff, um, related to 50 cent, which I have a theory about why 2024 is happening the way that 2024 is happening. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but first we're going to open ourselves up with just a little bit of an intro and we're all going to get in here um let me make sure i'm playing the right one of these as we as proceed, we proceed yes. to oh. give you what you need I turn the mics up, turn that mic up, yeah, the beat is knocking, leave that mic up, turn that shit the fuck up, uh, what, turn it louder, yeah, uh. Who shot ya? Uh, Separate the weak from the ops. Leap hard to creep them Brooklyn streets. It's on, nigga. Fuck all that bickering beef. I can hear sweat trickling down your cheek. Your heartbeat sound like Sasquatch's feet. Thundering, shaking the concrete. Then the shit stop when I fall the plot. Neighbors call the cops as they heard mad shot. Uh, saw me in the drop, three and a quarter. Slaughter, electrical tape around the daughter. Old school, new school, need to learn though I burn, baby, burn like disco inferno Burn slow like blunts with yayo Peel more skins than Idaho potato Niggas know the lyrical molesting is taking place Fucking with B.I.G. it ain't safe I make your skin chafe Rashes on the masses Bumps and bruises, blunts and land cruisers Big Papa smash fools, bash fools Niggas mad because I know the cash rules Everything around me, two Glock nines Any motherfucker whisperin' about mine And I'm, and I'm uh, Brooklyn's finest You rewind this, bad boys behind boys uh, 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 Like, excite all the freaks, stack mad chips, spread love with my peeps, niggas wanna creep, got to watch my back, 
think the cognac and in those sack make me slack. Make me I switch slack. it's all back. Cop sucker G's up. Uh, Won't force move, get Swiss cheese up. Click to tech, respect, I demand it. Slip and break Z. 11th commandment. Thou shalt not fuck with your C Papa. Feel a thousand deaths when I drop ya. I feel for uh, I you feel like Shaka Khan, I'm the dawn Pussy when I want Rolex on the arm You'll die slow but calm Recognize my face so there won't be no mistake So you know where to tell Jake Lame nigga, brave nigga Turn front page nigga Puff daddy flips daily I smoke the blunts, he sips on the bellies On the rocks, choke blocks of christenings I'm a cop in the fire positioning what? 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 Come here Come here, come on. open your fucking like mouth. Open your, did I tell you don't fuck with me? Huh? Did I tell you not to fuck with me? Huh? Look at you now. Huh? Can't talk with a gun in your mouth, huh? Bitch ass nigga. What? Who shot? All right, uh, maybe we should stop there before YouTube takes our stream down, don't you think? <laughs> So, homies, welcome to the stream. Welcome to the first Cancel This Conspiracy stream. Hopefully the first of many, many more. Um, glad we got most of us in here at this point. Um, here's the plan. If you're not all caught up on the court case as it is already established, I'm not going to go into all of the details of the court case the way that I've already done in various TikTok and X videos and stuff like that. Um, you can catch up on what's going on in the court case later. I might do a little bit of coverage of it. Um, and if we have time at the end, maybe I'll go through more of the details after we get into the new stuff. But I think it's big enough news that most of us are pretty up to date on like the big picture of what's going on. Um, and what I want to talk about is what might be going on soon and what we might expect coming out here in a little bit. Um, the funny irony is that my local supporters, I think the local stream is not working, even though you're the biggest homies of all. If locals is not working, I don't think it is. I'm sorry, guys. I love you. I'm going to find out how to make locals work. Hopefully, you're finding me on YouTube instead or on X. Um, so let's get into the meat of the matter because we have something new going on here um, that just popped up on 50 Cent's Twitter yesterday, I believe. March 26th, 50 Cent tweeted this uh, image that looks a lot like an announcement of a documentary. Um, and if you don't already know about this documentary, let me tell you about this documentary. It says, this is going to break records when this drop. GLG, Greenlight Gang, you know the vibes. Diddy do it? And if you're not up to date, 50 Cent has been calling out Diddy for a long time. 50 Cent has been saying a lot of shit. And he's in the, like, he knows he's in there. He's alleged that he's been sent videos. He's alleged that Diddy would send him some of the blackmail videos to sort of show off or like, you know, try to get 50 on his team. 50 Cent's a very influential guy. He's, uh, he's not easy to kill. Let's just say that. Um, and 50 Cent is announcing a documentary about Diddy apparently coming soon. Um, 50 Cent is known to, shall we say, bullshit on the internet a lot. He posts a lot of memes. So my first response to this was, hold up, is this real? And yes, it is. 50 Cent is dropping a documentary. And if you've been paying attention, which I was not before this, he announced this back in 2023. Um, this documentary has been covered by a lot of different news or outlets. Vibe, US Daily or Weekly, whatever this is. So... 50 Cent announced this documentary that he's releasing way back when the Cassie lawsuit dropped. And we're not going to talk about the Cassie lawsuit because it's dark and it's vile. And I read it once and a half times and that's too many times to read all that bullshit. Um, Diddy's an evil man. And so it got me thinking. You know how Cat Williams said on uh, that one podcast on the, I believe it's the Shay Shay show, um, Club Shay Shay. He said... He came out swinging. He's like, 2024 is the year when all lies will be exposed. Cat Williams clearly was like, I've known a lot of things, but now it's time to talk about all these things. And I think this documentary is the explanation. 
as in if 50 cent is producing a large documentary behind the scenes like very like high profile his website if you go to 50 cents website um i'm not going to jump over to it right now so i don't have to swap the stream out real quick but uh g unit films and television inc is well established and they've been producing documentaries for a long time um i'm gonna see if i can get this a little bigger for you guys to read what's going on this is just from the wikipedia page about it um so 50 cent and his company have been producing a lot of films over the years and this looks like their their latest one um and so the implications of this when you think about it are that the insiders in the industry knew about this documentary. They knew this was coming. And it can't help but wonder, did Lil Rod know this documentary was coming? Did Lil Rod, and this is just my speculation. These are not facts. But if I was Lil Rod, he's a producer in the industry. He might know 50 Cent. And if 50 Cent didn't know him, 50 Cent might reach out to get to know him. And what better PR to release this documentary to than right after this lawsuit drops? Like it suppose like, let's walk this through. If you're 50 cent, if you're 50 cent last year and you were to get in touch with Lil Rod, I mean, you already knew all the stuff that Diddy was up to, or at least a lot of it. And you knew a lot of the players involved and you, you, you had a lot of the evidence already yourself. And if you were to sit down in a meeting with Lil Rod and find out what Lil Rod knew and find out what evidence Lil Rod could bring in a case, you would know that that case would blow the world up. And you would know beyond a doubt that Lil Rod could bring that case very easily. And Lil Rod, if he's in the position to bring that case, his main concern would be his safety and whether or not his case is going to go through. And the best thing Lil Rod could do would be to have an ally like 50 Cent and to have sort of media backup on the way, reinforcements coming after his lawsuit drops to help push Diddy out of the way and to help bring down Diddy's base of power. Um, so I'm just speculating, but I kind of suspect that Lil Rod brought the case intentionally right now, almost as like a pre-funk to this documentary. And I suspect that 50 Cent and Lil Rod have talked about what's going on. And this timing is not accidental. Because when I posted this uh, screenshot that 50 Cent posted, a lot of the comments in the feed on X were like, oh, this has to be fake or this timing is super sus, not quite putting two and two together yet. That it's not like it's necessarily a coincidence. It's not like 50 Cent is trying to like ride the coattails of the hype. Like it's probably more likely that 50 Cent is behind creating the hype because holy shit, what a good marketing strategy. Like have you ever seen a documentary released on the marketing strategy of a the most publicized like court case in the industry in the last 20 years. God damn. So that's my big speculation. And uh, now we're going to kind of zoom out and look at some of this bigger picture here. Um, I'm going to share with you some of the notes that I've accumulated about the Diddy case, and we'll run through some of the bigger implications. Um, the big, the big elephant in the room, shall we say that I am, that we're not going to get into yet. Cause I haven't compiled the notes yet is Jay-Z. Um, so Jay, if you're watching the stream, I love you. Uh, I live in New Zealand. You'll never get to me. Don't come after me. Um, we'll wait for your court case to come out to talk about you a little more. Um, Lil Rod brought the court case in the first place, uh, February of this year, um, at the top of this document. Um, by the way, just a little bit of a primer on how to find these things. Um, how to do this kind of research is, let me see, can I, can I bring you, I'll stop sharing that screen and I'll bring up a screen where I can show you what we're doing here. Let's bring up this 50 cent screen. Cool. Um, and I'll show you some of this Googling that we do. So if you wanted to find a court case about like Lil Rod and Diddy, um, and you aren't experienced with finding court cases, you might type into the Google search bar something like, I mean, first off, court cases go by real names. They go by last names. So it's Rodney Jones. So it's Jones V. And look, you can already see it's suggesting what I searched. Jones V. Combs, because it's that's Diddy's real last name. 
And adding that you want to find a PDF is good. And adding archive means you want to find it on archive.org. I can't type. Um, but in this particular case, it's not on archive.org yet. That's a good place to find a lot of uh, stashed evidence, a lot of FBI files. Archive.org is gold. And there's a good reason why they want to take it down. But in this case, I have a Pacer Monitor account, but most people don't. So that won't work for you. Scribd is another. Uh, you have to subscribe to Scribd. But I'm actually using Brave Browser because fuck Google. But if you switch to Google, I believe... Uh, look, where's my Google? Where can, where, where can I where can I find that I'm doing to Google? Normally, it gives me a little option to search on Google here. Maybe what I'll do is I'll just go to Google because Google actually, unfortunately, gets a lot more results. Um, Combs v. Jones uh, court case PDF, and there you can find Digital Music News, and this one is not behind a paywall. And when we go there. You can find the whole case document and show you this because there is nothing more important. I mean, so this story is not super political. It's not controversial. There's not like a Trump Biden, like different media reporting everything completely differently kind of a vibe on this case. But in general, you should always go to primary sources. You should not trust media to tell you what something says. You should not trust media to tell you what someone believes or represents or whatever, especially in politics. And so this is just good practice of if you want to know about the Diddy case and you want to actually know about it, just go read the documents yourself. Um, a lot of times it's boring, but this case is not. I Trust me, this case is not boring. It's 73 pages, but damn, it is packed full of crazy stuff, tons of evidence. And most importantly to the bigger picture, it directly names Lucian Grange um, right here. Lucian Grange is, we're going to switch back to uh, my notes now. Lucian Grange is the CEO of Universal Music. Universal Music is massive. Universal Music is probably the biggest music company in the world right now. And do I have those notes open right now? I do. Billboard Top 100. Um, hopefully, I don't get censored for the extra notes I have in here. So what I did is I took the Billboard Top 100 list, which you can see here. Ignore these little notes. I was just kind of curious which ones are owned by people with allegiances to certain things. Um, not a factual representation necessarily, but Lucian Grange is pretty obviously connected in a certain direction to certain people. Um, and when you take the whole Billboard Top 100 list, all so here in my visual representation, I only went down to number 36. I did a spreadsheet where I went all the way down to number 100. It took way less time because I wasn't copying and pasting all my photo notes. Um, it turns out that Universal Music Group is responsible. They are the uh, the publishers of 33 out of the top 100 songs last year in 2023. That's one third of the most popular music in the industry is published by this guy, Lucian Grange. He's the CEO of Universal Music Group. And he's directly named in this lawsuit. And we'll go into that in a second. But that's people like uh, Taylor Swift. Here you can see Taylor Swift Antihero produced by Universal Music Group. Um, The Weeknd, 21 Savage, produced by Universal Music Group. The Weeknd and Ariana Grande, Universal Music Group. Uh, Sam Smith, Unholy, Universal Music Group. If you know, you know. Um, Drake and 21 Savage. So a lot of these are like multiple producers working together. A lot of them are kind of mo like, it's not as simple as just one company producing to each whatever, but you get the picture. These guys are deeply tied into so much of our most popular music in multiple industries like Taylor Swift, not rap music, still under the umbrella of Universal Music Group. And when you, you know, if you're one of those conspiracy theory people, you know, if you're a little more conspiracy minded, you just think about the types of messages in songs like Unholy as we talk about this. So back to our Diddy notes. Oh, I'm so glad I can finally share my notes with you guys. I spent a lot of time. I used to not take notes. I used to just take screenshots of everything as I was like, I'm going to make a video about this. And I'll just take a bunch of screenshots real quick while I do the research. And it would wind up with just this crazy camera roll of like endless photos. It's like you could, I could never go back 
and reuse my information from an old video in a new video. I'd have to like redo it all. It's such a waste of time. So starting to take these notes revolutionized my reporting and my understanding of what's going on. But it also has become a really like valuable just archive of information and research. So it feels good to be able to finally share some of it, even though a lot of it is probably not YouTube PG. So let's talk about Lucian real quick. Lucian Grange is named in this lawsuit as having attended these parties with Diddy. He's, his face is in the lawsuit. His name is in the lawsuit. There are direct allegations that he was attending these listening parties where there's photos from the parties in the lawsuit um and he directly alleges they were spiking the bottles of drinks with drugs and that grange was at those parties where it was well known that they were spiking these drinks at these parties um there were back rooms all of the rooms in the parties were wired up with secret cameras which is very epstein of them that's not a thing i've said this a lot but like in case you don't realize this lawsuit alleges that going all the way back like that this has been going on for 20 years or more um, it specifically alleges back to a shooting that Jayla was involved in that he, he, he says that it's been going on at least since then. Um, 20 years ago, early two thousands, I don't know if you remember, but like this was not around back then. Technology was a whole different ball game. When you look at like when the rap music video from Biggie that I played at the start of this, like remember how bad footage was, remember how big cameras were wiring up a home in the early 2000s with hidden cameras all secretly recording to like a big secret archive that is not a thing that some rapper knows how to do that's a high level intelligence operation and we all know who else was doing those kinds of high level intelligence operations um even dating all the way back to uh the mob um blackmailing J. Edgar Hoover in the 40s and 50s with sexual blackmail and sexual blackmail parties back in the day. Um, all of the sexual blackmail operations that have happened that we know of so far, so far, they all have ties to intelligence networks. And that would be the CIA and the Mossad, um, which are kind of just two branches of the same thing, depending on which countries they need to operate in. That's a whole other topic, though. Um, so it'd be kind of weird if Diddy himself, just Diddy, had connections to people that could do that kind of stuff. But it makes a lot more sense when it's not just Diddy, because it's not. Diddy, and I've talked about a lot of this before, but we're going to briefly skim the bigger picture of why, like, why this expands out into the whole industry, not just the rappers directly associated with Diddy. Diddy came on the scene as like a kid. He was like 21. This is just from his Wikipedia, Bad Boy Records. It was founded in 1993 by Sean Puffy Combs. At the time, he was 24 years old. Um, is it in my screenshot here? He was born in 1969. So he started working as an unpaid intern at age 21 at Bad Boy Records. And within three years, he was promoted to be the A&R. Well, sorry. He started at age 21, not at Bad Boy Records, at another agency um, managed by Andre Harrell. And he quickly rose the ranks, probably through putting certain things in his mouth. Um, if you just look at the people involved, Andre Harrell, mostly. And then at a certain point, Clive Davis took note. Clive Davis was sort of above Andre Harrell, is my understanding. And Clive Davis has been like deep in the industry for a very long time. Um, and so he sees this up and coming guy, P. Diddy, who I can only assume he discovered was really down with being a degenerate piece of shit and being a gangster, horrible person that probably was down with, you know, doing certain gay stuff that Clive was also into. Uh, and he's like, this is the perfect guy to start a new record label in the rap industry. And I'm going to promote him and I'm going to pay for this new label, Bad Boy Records, because it's not cheap to start a label, especially when you're 24. And that's when you get into the Biggie and the Tupac thing. That's a whole other thing. We're not going to get into that right now. Let's just say... It's looking like Diddy called some hits on some people back then. But Clive Davis, and if you if you can't read between the lines here, Clive Davis and Lucian Grange are both Jewish, which is not to say that, certainly not to say that all Jewish people are bad, not to say that all Jewish people are involved in this kind of stuff by any means. That's not what we're saying. I'm just saying that if you are the Mossad or the CIA, but in this case, more specifically Mossad, 
you already have affiliation with someone in this position who's of the same faith as your organization because you can go to them and be like, hey, we're similar. We're fighting for the same team. And this is that's just speculation. We don't know if Clive Davis had any contact with Mossad. All we know is that Lucian Grange and Clive Davis were the two people responsible for bringing Diddy into the position of power that he was in, which included having multiple mansions wired up with secret cameras all ready for these big blackmail parties that are very reminiscent of Epstein. And so that is why we speculate that these guys might have had connections with Mossad. But then if you look at Clive Davis and you just, just read his Wikipedia page, you start reading names like uh, Janis Joplin, uh, Pink Floyd, Whitney Houston, obviously. Um, excuse me. What else we got here? Ace of Base, Patti Smith. Al Jurgensen, Lou Reed. I think the really good ones are down here. Back in the 60s. Yeah, here we got Janis Joplin again. Santana, Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Aerosmith, Pink Floyd again, Earth, Wind, and Fire, The Grateful Dead. So these guys have been connected in to so much of the music industry for so long and we don't have direct evidence that what diddy is doing in the rap industry was being done back then the only connection we have is that diddy was selected pretty obviously by clive davis to be elevated into the position where he could do these operations and if clive davis is at all involved in doing that sort of thing now what's to say he wasn't doing it back then um just speculation so that's out there. Briefly, I want to talk about the other really juicy uh, connection that we have here. Um, by the way, 25,000 of you, um, I'm not good at this enough to be like all up in the chats. I'm just totally myself and my dog under the table here. I don't have like some intern in the chats. Um, I love you all and I appreciate your chats. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, this is very strange. My life was very different one year ago, but um, all, all lies will be exposed and we've all got to do our part. So let's talk about Fahim because Fahim is spicy. Um, <clears throat> and this is the connection that, that was dangling out in the lawsuit. Um, this Jones v. Combs lawsuit, it was in there kind of hanging out, but I don't think anybody had quite put two and two together. I think this is kind of why my reporting kind of blew up on it is and actually, it wasn't me that put the connection together. Um, shout out to you guys. It was people in my comments that are more tuned into this stuff that noticed that this guy in the Diddy lawsuit, Fahim Muhammad, who was like the fixer that you were supposed to... Oh, sorry. You can't see my notes because they're not on the stream right now. Boom. This guy, Fahim Muhammad. He was Diddy's fixer. He was the guy that like everyone that worked around Diddy was instructed to call him if they even got pulled over, like if there was any trouble, because of course they were all carrying drugs for Diddy all the time and guns and prostitutes and Lord knows what else. So if they ever had any trouble, they called Fahim and Fahim would fix it. Um, Fahim apparently had uh, connections with the LAPD, connections with Lord knows what, Um that could make investigations go away in this lawsuit. It's directly alleged that he made a murder go away. Um, that's the aftermath of the murder. The LAPD saw this bathroom where Jones alleges that he directly witnessed. Um, did he shoot someone? And uh, the police came, they saw it all, they investigated it all. And did he just told everyone to say it was a drive by shooting, sweep it under the rug. And the LAPD was like, yep, sounds like a drive by shooting. And they left. Um, that's not the only time that's ever happened before. So who is Fahim? Well, people in my comments, uh, you legends, put two and two together and realized that Fahim Muhammad was Michael Jackson's head of security. And you don't have to dig very far to realize, I mean, you have to dig a little far because anyone that doesn't have a Wikipedia page is inherently harder to research because they're just far more obscure. There's often multiple people with the same name that you have to kind of sort through. Having a name like Fahim makes it a little easier. But um, doing my research on him, it became quickly apparent that I was able to find a couple sources that crossed to make sure I'm talking about the same Fahim Muhammad, make sure I'm talking about the same guy. He's the guy that has a ton of land and gave his kid a bunch of land on the border of Mexico. Um, he's like in real estate now. But uh, where can we go to this? Where, where can we go to this? Hey, Penn alumni. 
right here. In 2008, Fahim graduated from Sacramento State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration with a concentration in Real Estate and Marketing. In 2008. In 2009, he was the head of Michael Jackson's security when Michael Jackson died. So that means that a dude, like a 21-year-old dude or whatever, 22-year-old dude, is a little hard to cross-reference how old he is. I had to like backtrack from an article that said he was 30. That means that he's like 22, 23, 24. He just graduated college one year ago, and he is assigned to be the head of Michael Jackson's security detail. And then Michael Jackson is so Michael Jackson was addicted to painkillers and he was taking he was addicted to a lot of things, um, probably because of his doctor, who knows? And he was taking this sedative that's like way too, not supposed to be used as a sedative for sleeping as a sleeping aid. So he was every night he was going to sleep using this drug to help him sleep. And so they found him dead, overdosed on that drug. Um, and I'm just going to throw it out. So like the blame during the trials all went to his doctor for like prescribing this drug. And like, and so it was like apparently an accidental overdose on this drug. And it was because of the doctor's fault that, but like, bro, when someone's asleep, anyone can come in and like overdose them. Like, I'm just saying, that's just, that's just speculation. I'm not, I'm not making any allegations or any claims. I'm sure Fahim is a great guy, but he was the second person on the scene right after doctor doctors already in the room allegedly apparently giving cpr to michael jackson and then michael jackson's kids found his body um and Fahim helped get the kids out of there uh and then immediately after he so so thoroughly failed to protect the king of pop he then is shall we say rewarded by being hired by diddy to run diddy's sexual blackmail operation security and yes, security for an operation like that, I mean, in order to secure those kinds of places, those kinds of operations, you have to know everything that's going on. You need to know who's coming and going. You need to know what substances are where, what guns are where, what people are where. So Fahim Muhammad being, my, being the head of Diddy's security means that he was like managing in a big way all of these illegal operations. And his only experience is a business and marketing degree with a specialization in real estate and overseeing the not suspicious death of the king of pop. Not suspicious at all. Just saying. I'm very curious. I mean, I'm curious where Diddy is right now, but I'm also very curious where our boy Fahim is right now because let's be real. He probably knows where more of the bodies are buried than Diddy does. Um, and Diddy knows a lot of things. So that's our boy Fahim. Oh, real quick, this is just a fun tidbit. This, so he he has all this real estate because he started a real estate company um, as like his side gig. So his his security company is called Elite Transportation and Security Services. And did I take a screenshot of his uh, this real estate company development company? Uh, it's called Oasis. Um, Oasis is a real estate and investment development company that he's trying to like do. Uh, it sounds, I mean, it sounds good. It sounds like he's trying to like get all this real estate and kind of like get it available to minorities and black youth and stuff and kind of like help people out with getting homes. Um, but because he has all this property, he gifted his son for, I think his 15th birthday, like hundreds of acres of land as a portion of this big parcel that he had bought right on, in San Diego County um, on the border of Tijuana. But it's not just in San Diego County, um, right there. Yes, boom. So I found in the CBS 8 article that I was reading, they apparently went to visit him on this property to interview him about this. It was like kind of a big story that he was gifting his 15-year-old son all this land. A bunch of news articles picked it up. You can find them yourself if you kind of Google the keywords of what I'm talking about or if you see what I've got here in the screenshot. Right here. When CBS 8's Anna Laurel drove out to meet Muhammad and his family in Boulevard, there were boulders, trees, and the U.S.-Mexico border wall. So wherever this land is, it's on the literal border somewhere near to Tijuana. Just throwing it out there. Just thought that was kind of nifty. Um, let me make sure. How are we doing on the stream? I'm in the comments on YouTube. Are we still doing good? I think we're still doing good. 
looks like we're still doing it. We got 31,000 people in here. You guys are fucking awesome. I love you guys. I would like to uh, push for a world where more of us are doing research, citing sources, and journalism looks like this instead of like, hey, I'm the news. Trust me because I know what's best. Actually, real quick, let's do it. We're live streaming. We can do whatever we want. Sue me, Google. Um, we're going to quickly just show you what the rest of the world of journalism looks like right now. I'm going to point out how to spot journalism that is not journalism because I think it's hilarious. Um, so one of my favorite websites is uh, Politico. Yeah, Politico. Um, let's do. Let's look up Pizzagate. I think we just got our stream taken down for saying this, but don't worry, all you internet censors. We're going to debunk it right now, and I'm going to show how the mainstream media has debunked this thing. Um, Politico, perfect. That's what we need. They are a trustworthy mainstream news organization that does high quality journalism, and you know that they do high quality journalism because ooh, good, good photo. I should steal that photo. Because they see, they cite all their sources. Um, maybe I'll blow this up so you can really see for us. See in here, right here, they cite all their sources, right? Like the truth, of course, was far different. The mere material made public in a federal court. And I actually, I don't know what article I'm on. I'm just assuming it's going to do what I think it's going to do. But let's check their source, right? Because anytime that a journalist is citing their sources, you should check their sources to make sure they're, you know, being straight. Oh, hey. I thought it might take us to another Politico article. So what Politico has just done is they've cited themselves as a source. Okay, let's see if this article cites any sources. No, this article does not cite any sources. So we'll go back to the other one. Okay, how about the next source? Donald Trump pops up in the documents, including some released on Monday. So maybe this source would take us to the documents that were released on Monday. That would be right, like the, the good thing to do as a journalist, right? Hey, Daily Mail, at least they didn't link to themselves. Does Daily Mail have the documents? Okay, so they've got screenshots of the documents. That's better than I was expecting. That's not, you know, what? okay. But still, they're giving us little clips they have pre-selected. You know, we could do better. Let's, let's, give the, let's give Politico one more chance. There we go. Like, it started off with stuff like Whitewater, Travelgate, stuff that is ancient history by now. Ancient history? Ah, The Guardian, citing more news agencies as sources. See... None of these are primary sources. If they really wanted to be good journalists and cite sources, they would do something like um, Epstein documents, PDF, and then you put in the word archive and it'll highlight archive.org, which is the gold standard. Can we find it? Boom, Inter internet archive. Okay, so that's actually not what we want. That's a podcast. Maybe I need to be a little more specific. One that I know is easy to find is Epstein uh, flight logs, PDF, archive. Boom, right there on archive.org. See, this is a primary source. And sometimes on archive.org, you have to double check what you're actually looking at because a lot of the stuff on archive.org is actually, um, it's like anyone can kind of upload stuff. So you do sometimes have to double check what you're reading on archive.org. But if you were to cite a source about like the Epstein documents, the source should take you to the Epstein documents. But that's not how mainstream journalism does things these days. And so I take this detour just to point out that we should live in a world where people are citing their sources. And I try my best to make a point of either showing where I'm finding these sources, showing part of the top bar in my sources so you can know what I'm citing, or like here, it's obviously Wikipedia. And when it's not obviously Wikipedia, I try to do things like include the URL bar in it so that if you wanted to, you could go and type in that URL and find the source for yourself. Because if you can't double check someone's work, it's just their opinion. It's not actually information. Um, anytime that you are watching any content, any, especially news, especially politics and stuff, if they are not citing sources and you cannot double check where their information is coming from, it's coming from nowhere but their fucking mouth and you should not trust them. Maybe they're right. Maybe they are trustworthy and they're just having a conversation or something. But anytime someone's trying to present facts as facts, you got to have sources. That's like academia 101, but we all know what academia is turning into these days. 
Um, so we wound up over in these parts of my notes that maybe we're not supposed to talk about. I don't know. Um, I mean, on X, I'm sure we're good. I don't know if the X stream is still up, but this is what I was talking about earlier. We're going to briefly just talk about how J. Edgar Hoover, if you don't know, <laughs> you all need to know about J. Edgar Hoover. And I assume most of you homies already know about Hoover because Hoover founded the FBI and he ran the FBI for like 30 years. Um, if you go to his Wikipedia page, you can find out. So before the FBI, there was the Bureau of Investigation um, back in like the 20s. He founded it in 1924. He was the lead of the BOI from, or from 1924 for 11 years. And then they founded the FBI in 1935. And then he was the director of the FBI for 37 years, totaling up to 48 years leading what was the FBI, more or less. That's like 50 years. That's insane. And when people talk about the deep state, what they're talking about is unelected bureaucrats, unelected politicians, and people of power like Hoover that have immense amounts of power in our government, in our law enforcement, in our policy, you know, all over that you did not vote for, that are not elected. They're just there. And 50 years of controlling the FBI is the perfect example. And if you don't know where I'm getting lost here, where's, where's our boy Clyde? There's our boy Clyde Tolson. So. Hoover's best buddy was this guy named Clyde Tolson right there. He was like his main assistant. He was also his gay lover. And there's no shame on, no shade on gay people. That's all good. Do your thing. It's 2024. Um, you know, everyone's, everyone's a human. Do your thing. But Hoover built his whole career in the McCarthy era, fomenting what was called the Lavender Scare. Um, the Lavender Scare. So this is back during the Cold War. And during the Cold War, they were foam. I mean, not just Hoover, but he was a big part of this. The Lavender Scare was this fear that everyone was stoking that if you're gay, you're susceptible to blackmail by the Soviet Union because it's not cool to be to be gay back then. And it's especially not cool once they fomented this whole Lavender Scare thing, because it's like if what if the Soviet Union got blackmail on you and then you could be blackmailed by the enemy if you're gay? So no one should be gay. We should find all the gay politicians. We should kick them out because they are like they are a weakness to our democracy. And the Soviet Union, to be fair, they had a bang and spy network. Like the Soviet Union during the Cold War was kicking the FBI and the CIA's every direction. You should read Legacy of Ashes if you want to know how, just how incompetent the CIA was back in the day when they were found. I mean, forever, really. But so the irony of Hoover being involved in fomenting this lavender scare is that Hoover himself was gay and he was boning his main assistant, Clyde Tolson. And they, everyone kind of knew it like around him. It was kind of an open secret, but, uh, Meyer Lansky, where you at Meyer Lansky, the head of the Jewish mob and a lot of it. So Meyer Lansky actually merged the mafia and the mob. He was like, he founded what was called the National Crime Syndicate. If you don't know all this stuff, you should definitely read One Nation Under Blackmail by Whitney Webb. It is mandatory reading for understanding what's happening in the world today. She's wicked smart. It's like, she, it's hard to read. You might listen to it on Audible instead. I had to listen to it two times before I really started to understand what was going on. But Meyer Lansky had photos of Clyde and Hoover. Uh, the, the, the direct alleged evidence is the first photos he had was a blowjob between these two. And then they proceeded to get a lot more dirt on them because they hosted, they started hosting all these blackmail parties at this place called the Plaza hotel in what was called the blue suites, um, where Hoover was already blackmailed. So he was like, fuck it, let's go have a party. And they proceeded to sort of have this joint, like FBI mob mafia, like blackmail sting operation where, they were already all blackmailed. And so Hoover was just like, let's go and I'll get blackmail on everybody else. And they would all go and cross dress and have giant gay cross dressing parties in rooms wired up full of cameras. So that was as far as we kind of currently know in the mainstream of like disclosed indisputable truth. That sort of is the first example of a very well evidenced case of sexual blackmail using oh my internet's a little bad i hope we're not cutting out too bad i hope we're still here for you guys that was the first case in the plaza hotel with hoover and lansky and all this that was the first case of us knowing about modern video technology being used for sexual blackmail because sexual blackmail has existed for 
ages. It's not new, but sexual blackmail with a video camera is a whole different ball game. And they pioneered it. And just want to point out, Meyer Lansky was not associated with Mossad or Israel because they didn't exist yet. He was associated with the Jewish mob. And so the Jewish mob, the FBI, and later the CIA pioneered video cameras for sexual blackmail. And then you know what happens with Homeboy later on. Um, that's why the Diddy ties have so many implications bigger than what, you know, than just the surface of the court case. As of right now, so if you don't know, as of right now, or if you were confused, there's a lot of different reporting about his plane. Diddy's plane, um, my understanding, I've not actually, I have not done a ton of confirmation on all of this because there's clearly no like clear facts yet. But Diddy's, one of Diddy's planes or his only plane, I don't know, took off from Los Angeles and flew. And it was apparently on the way to uh, Cape Verde, I believe, Isla Verde, uh, Verde, 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 one of the countries over here that has no uh, extradition treaty. And the speculation is, so they were called and, and told to land and they were forced down in Antigua and Barbuda, which is this little island in the British Virgin Islands, right next to Jeffrey's Island, actually. Jeffrey's Island is like just a little ways up, but... They were forced down to land in this other country, apparently. And the speculation is that they were forced to land there because Diddy's name must have been on the manifest. And that's not, I, my understanding is that we're not thinking that because anyone has seen the manifest. I think it's speculation based on like, they would only force the plane down if they thought Diddy was on it. I would actually speculate that they have not posted an arrest warrant for Diddy yet what they actually did is they raided his home for evidence, right? And so they have an ongoing criminal case, which is separate from this Combs v. Jones civil suit. So whatever happened in the civil suit brought up enough evidence that either an already ongoing criminal investigation got more evidence, or they opened a new criminal investigation because you don't arrest from a civil case. You need a criminal case, different things. So my speculation is actually that what they're doing right now is they are subpoenaing evidence. They're raiding for evidence. They're I bet that they actually landed this plane to get the evidence that was probably on it, not necessarily Diddy, because Diddy was apparently not on the plane. It looks like the plane was actually him flying a bunch of evidence away, like all of his sexual blackmail tapes, maybe, allegedly, possibly. Um, so they have the plane. They do not have Diddy. We don't really know where Diddy is. There's been a lot of online speculation about like TMZ posting videos of Diddy at Florida airport, Miami airports, like wherever. Don't trust TMZ. Don't do it. I, I almost made the mistake of doing that on Twitter. Just don't. TMZ's filming all kinds of bullshit. I'm pretty sure the footage that they posted from Florida was like actually like a month old or something. Like, I don't know. Don't trust TMZ. They're not a source. Okay. Um, they lie for clicks like no one's business. Um, so the state of the game right now, if you're new to the stream and you're just jumping in, we're going to finish the stream. I love you guys. There's 40. Let's see if we can get to 42,000. 42 is a good number. And that'll be where we finish this off. Um, there's obviously so much more we can talk about. There's a lot to talk about with Keefe D. There's a lot of allegations that have been coming out of people that are in prison. Um, that I honestly, I wouldn't be allowed to play on stream on YouTube. So you'll have to find those things yourself. We'll talk about it on Twitter. Twitter's the spot right now, but we're going to finish where we started with 50 cents documentary knowing what we know now my speculation what i here I, <clears throat> okay my speculation knowing everything we know now 50 cent is releasing a documentary called did he do it original docu series coming soon He's releasing it from his G unit films and television Inc company. That's produced tons of films in the last 10, 20 years. Um, and it looks very professional and I bet it's going to be very professional. And it like, he announced it a year ago. Well, not a full year, but he announced it in 2023 after Cassie brought her allegations, but it didn't get a lot of press and it kind of went under the radar for a lot of people. I think because a lot of people still think that this was fake. They thought this was just a meme. It is not, it's a real documentary. Um, and it is apparently now coming soon. So it's theoretically already done filming. It's wrapped. What that means is that he's been working on this documentary behind the scenes all this time. And if 50 cents working on this documentary behind the scenes all this time, people like Cat Williams can catch wind of that. People that are in the know on the inside knew that this documentary was coming. They knew that 
quote unquote disclosure was coming. 2024 is the year when all lies will be exposed. My speculation was that the lawsuit from Lil Rod probably actually was brought in conjunction with 50 Cent being ready to release this documentary because Lil Rod is in the industry. He's a producer. They People know each other. And Lil Rod would have feared for his life to bring that lawsuit if he didn't have backup. And there's no better backup to have in the music industry than 50 Cent. Um, I wonder if it'll play me this video. I hope you guys can hear him. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys can hear this window with Cat Williams right now. But, uh, if you haven't already seen Cat Williams' clip about how all lies will be exposed in 2024, you should go watch the Club Shay Shay uh, episode with Cat Williams. It is, at this point, required reading for understanding the entertainment industry in 2024 because we are not done yet by any means. They currently have Diddy's, at least one of Diddy's kids in custody. Diddy's kids were involved. They are total scumbags as well. They are in the lawsuit. They're evil. It's not like Diddy ran off on his kids that were innocent and now his poor kids. Are, no, his kids are dick deep in all of this. Um, Diddy's on the lam right now, as far as we know. I'm sure that he'll get arrested before long. The real question, the big question that we should all be wondering about that I'm going to be digging on, the one we all want to know is when's Jay-Z going to get arrested? Because Jay-Z and Beyonce. So here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. This is actually a discussion. We're, this, this is going to be our last thing. It's 20, 55 minutes on the stream. I'm hoping hoping I can wrap up this thought in the next five minutes and we call it good on the outro. But check it out. Fifth, so Diddy had protection for decades. Diddy was untouchable. He had connections with law enforcement and the feds. He could make investigations go away. No one was touching him. Why are they touching him now, right? Clearly, his protection has run out. Just like Epstein's protection, eventually he got too high profile and it was like they were able to run protection on him the first time he got arrested, but the second time it was like, this is too much. Move on to plan B. Let's allow him to suicide himself to, I've, I've given up trying to not get deplatformed at this point on the stream. Diddy's protection clearly ran out. What, what, what changed? Why and, and why sever him? And, and so put two and two together here. If 50 Cent is working on this documentary, if Lil Rod has all this evidence, he's about to bring this case, like all of these rumblings behind the scenes, um, if we're talking about intelligence agency connections, that means there's intelligence agency level surveillance into this industry, probably at least in some regards, to protect him and to understand the, the landscape and to make sure things are going smooth. And when they get word about this whole situation getting ready to go down, suddenly his protection severs and they basically seemed to cut him loose. And now investigations can't be made to go away. He's like, they literally swat his homes with like probably over a hundred armed, like full on military personnel in multiple States at once. That is clearly the end of his protection. Why? Like, here's my speculation. This is just my speculation. Diddy is really central into the rap industry. His connections are purely rap industry, right? I mean, he's talked to Obama a little bit. He's, he's gotten a little political a little bit. He's kind of goes out a little bit. But Jay-Z and Beyonce, they extend way beyond the rap industry, way beyond the rap industry. And they are deeply implicated here. They are so t closely tied in, not just with Diddy himself, but with the people that made Jay-Z and Beyonce come up. Um, Clive Davis is involved in that picture. Lucian Grange is definitely involved in that picture. But that's where you get to people like Scooter Braun and Liar Cohen, um, people like Len Blavatkin. Uh, if these people start to get implicated and start to get in on this, like 
Jay-Z and Beyonce have been deeply tied to the Democratic White House for a long time. They are tied to Marina Abramovich. And if you don't know who that is, I didn't tell you. Google it for yourself. Um, we definitely can't talk about Marina Abramovich on the stream and her spirit cooking dinners. Suddenly, if Jay-Z and Beyonce get involved in this scandal, there is no telling how far that might pop things open and what might come out of those holes. Um, so my speculation is that Diddy's getting cut loose right now and they're going to try to make him take the fall for everything because if it spirals out of control beyond Diddy into these other implications of who else was running similar situations along these lines, there could be so much more than just the rap industry on the table. That is my speculation. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be right. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. All I know is that this documentary is going to be fire and it's going to get a lot of, a lot of people are going to watch this documentary. I'm definitely going to watch that documentary. Um, that, that's all we're going to do for the research roundup for today. Um, I am so humbled by the number of people that are in here, the number of, pe number of people that are supporting me. Well, I've got a bunch of the homies here. Um, some things that I don't normally like, some housekeeping that I just want to tell you all. I love you. I appreciate you. If you've bought a shirt, I love you so much. Thank you. Um, it's just a great way to supplement my income and to wear sassy slogans. And I, you know, I don't make a ton of money off of them, but it is supporting me and I, I appreciate it. If you've recently ordered a shirt and they've been on back order, I just fixed all that today. They're on their way. Sorry. I'm not good at this whole technology thing. We're just doing our best. Um, if you have donated on like PayPal or on cash, App, cash app allows me to send you hearts back to appreciate that you're helping me. But if you've donated on any of the platforms like PayPal, cash app, locals, all of it, I appreciate you so much. Um, I don't like, I don't talk about financials a lot and I don't talk about my life a lot because I don't want everyone to know where I am and what I'm doing and all that. But uh, like financing life in this age is not easy. And you guys supporting me through all these different means literally kept me from going bankrupt the last couple of months. Like it, like my car broke down. I had a bunch of rent that I had to deal with. There was a bunch of stuff going on and I was like wicked close to fully having no money to pay for all my shit. And all of your support, like I'm doing okay now, but all of your support through the last six months in all of those channels literally is responsible for this content now existing. And I just was able to upgrade all of my technology to get this camera, to get this microphone. I bought a new computer that's not from like 2007 because you guys got me through that hard part. And now I can hopefully start to build my infrastructure so that I can produce higher quality content so that I can share things like my notes with you so that I can do this job correctly. So thank you. That is only possible because of you guys and pe places like PayPal don't allow me to contact you back and say, thank you. So this is me saying, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, if you don't have money to give, don't worry about it. Just watch the streams, just engage with the post, just learn, be involved, speak up. It's not about money. It's just about the world. Like it's just about the information. It's about changing our culture. Um, as long as I can survive and feed my dog and myself, we are all good. It's not a big deal. Um, the thing I want to close with is just saying that like, there's a lot going on in the world right now. There's a million different things in a million different directions. This election year is going to be fucking crazy. There's going to be division in every direction. And it's so important to remember, like, I know there are people far on the left and far on the right watching right now. I know there's people in every like possible economic situation the most important thing for us all to just kind of keep in mind while we're getting divided all the time by the media and by everything is that we are all so much more similar to each other than we are to any of these people that are controlling our lives, that are making our policies, that are ruining our economy. We are one big people with differences, with disagreements, with all sorts of different opinions, with different knowledge, different competencies, but we are so much more similar to each other than they want us to believe. And it is so important that when you meet people that believe differently than you this year, when it's going to be so easy to be angry with each other, that you extend a little empathy, you ask a lot more questions than spewing rhetoric and answers at people like try to bridge gaps, even with the people that are most different than you, because most people are just doing their best to synthesize the world and make it better the way they see as true. And it's not most people's fault when they're deceived by media, when they're deceived by propaganda, when they're misinformed because of their education or because of whatever their circumstances are. Everyone's just doing their best. So try to engage with people that are different with you 
as civilly and kindly as possible, right? Because the moment you start an argument about any topic, about politics, about news, about race, religion, gender, whatever, the moment you argue, you guarantee that the person you're talking to will never agree with you. They will immediately fight to try to convince you. And an argument only widens the divide. It is so much more useful to start by finding common ground, start by finding something you agree on, start by just asking them their opinion and listening to what they think and not trying to correct all the things you think are not true. Even if you're right, it's so much more effective to listen to someone tell you the wrong things for five minutes and just hear them all the way out and not correct them and not argue with them and just be like, I... I didn't hear those sources. I don't know that information. I disagree with you, but I don't want to argue with you. I like, I just want to know they will be so much more receptive to your point of view in the future, or even just to like enjoying your company and being different, but on the same team as you, if you don't argue. So I know I get sassy on Twitter. I know I spit sass for days on Twitter. Um, it's, it's fun. And I mean, it be, it, it, it builds the brand. And some people deserve a little sass on the internet. You know, Twitter is like, if you're in the gladiator ring, like you better be ready to fight. But in person, especially, I mean, on the internet, we should try to be a little more gracious, but in person, especially try to be more gracious with people that are different than you and bridge gaps, bridge divides as much as possible. Because I guarantee you that 2024, maybe there'll be some good stuff. Like maybe there'll be a lot of disclosure. Maybe, maybe the lies will be exposed, but you can guarantee that a lot of more lies will be shoveled into our lives and into our media landscape this year, we are just getting started. The election in America is still like six, seven months away. So just try your best to bridge instead of divide. Um, that's all I got for you. Thanks for being here. We're going to do a lot more of this. Um, I really appreciate all of you being here. It's very humbling. This is not, not what I planned to do with my life a year ago, but I'm so glad it is what I'm doing with my life. We're going to roll the outro. And I will see you all on the next one. American conspiracy theories are dangerous. Information is the oxygen of a democracy. American conspiracy theories are dangerous. Information is the oxygen of a democracy. It's so sick that we can't talk about it. It actually lifted up. And it could actually turn. I'm gonna ask you to look away. Legend has it that Christian Rosenkreutz drew his secret knowledge from the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians. They estimated a hundred yards from the left wing was this hundred foot this. You began to get into this uh, very scary scenario that has to do with the human condition of uh, the proclivity to accumulate vast amounts of power around a handful of people. And right now these misanthropic sociopaths are running the planet into the ground. Now I am become death. The destroyer of worlds. There's so much evidence out there that even if less than 1% is true, that would be enough to collapse the current paradigm and change the whole planet. Our security is at stake.